Sanders is is world renowned expert in in algorithms and and certainly learning algorithms and he's also my partner in crimes and we're working in the brain and and he's going to tell us about unsupervised learning. Okay. Make sure you ask him about the Jan Lacan quote. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very excited. It's Friday afternoon. Um, uh, I'm talking to people who sh probably I'm going to waste their time. And uh, I'm following Christos' uh, talks. So, what could be better? <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, unsupervised learning. And what do we mean by that? Um, right. uh, data, and, but the data has no labels. And you'd like to understand it, find some patterns in it, make use of it, maybe understand what data to collect. There are many extensions to this, but I'll restrict myself to really no labels, data with no labels. You could have semi-supervised, interactive, lifelong learning where you're transferring concepts from one to the other. And they're all very interesting, more recent, but uh, yeah. And there are basically two high-level approaches to, to unsupervised learning. There's clustering. You want to take your data and group it into similar uh, things that are dissimilar from the groups are dissimilar. And for this sort of the high-level approaches that, we've, that, have, that have gone into play, have been analyzed, you pick an objective function or some other quality measure and try to optimize it. Um, and the other approach is, is, is uh, model fitting, where you hypothesize a model for the data. Um, could be deterministic or probabilistic. The latter are more common. And then the goal of the algorithm is to estimate parameters of this model. And then uh, if, if the parameters you come up with are much uh, less likely than, uh, than those of a random model in this class you're considering, then maybe, maybe it's something interesting. So that's the... That's the second approach. These are the two sort of high-level approaches. OK, so there are many challenges and issues here in understanding this. You know, first, yes, the data is unlabeled, but you still need some domain knowledge and insight to define the right problem. If you're going after an objective function, what, what makes sense? And many of you might have seen these examples where if you try one objective, you get a very different clustering than a different objective, and so on. Um, and then, you know, uh, so we like generalized problems with mathematical appeal. So this can be an issue when, if you want to have. <coughs> um, yeah. and nevertheless, some beautiful problems and techniques have emerged. And that's what I'm going to focus on. What's provably worked, a few examples of things that have provably worked in, in, in this field. Um, many of these ideas and algorithms, successful ones in machine learning, are due to neuroscientists. We already saw some in the, in, 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 in the morning's talks, for Sipran, for example. Um, uh, and we'll see some more. Uh, there's a lot to understand. Uh, and um, of course, one of, the, one of the issues is, how is the brain learning? You could argue that much of it is unsupervised. You know, we're not telling the kids to do some objective function. Yeah. Um, the, the quote from Lacun that Christos mentioned is, uh, he says uh, uh, that uh, the revolution will not be supervised. <laughs> so. In, in, so uh, it's, a, it's a talk thing, so yeah. OK. Uh, now there, in addition to these meta uh, approaches, there are also meta methods, you might call it. Principal component analysis, we'll see several slides on this, what we can prove about it. Uh, K-means, and it's an algorithm that people use all the time when you don't have labels. Expectation maximization, EM. Gradient descent, certainly. And so on. And the, the nice thing about these is that you can just use one of them right away on almost on, on many data sets, so it's great. Um, but then, are they actually working? Will they converge? What will they converge to? When, why? These are all questions that are open for the most part, and certainly in supervised learning as well. OK, so here, here are the examples I picked. Mixture models, independent component analysis, finding planted structures, graph clustering, and some snippets from uh, computer science attempts at understanding bits of neuroscience. 
Okay, there are many other interesting models, some of which might be relevant to this semester, such as learning discrete distributions, hidden Markov models, and I'm mentioning the ones on which there's, there's been interesting and, and, and surprising progress. Learning dictionaries, you know, we, we saw a very brief introduction to sparse coding in Bruno's talk yesterday. That, that has led to lots of work in theoretical computer science, identifying relevant features, and so on. So it's a vast area. Okay. So mixture models. What are mixture models? Uh, the classical. So just to get a sense, uh, how many of you already know what a mixture model is? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, so think of the data as points in space. So you, you're seeing a bunch of data. Each one is a point in space. So it's measured various things. Uh, and uh, you see these points, and you want to know is the data coming, perhaps? from a mixture of a small number of uh, nice distributions. The nicest distributions, we can, general distributions we can think of are Gaussians. So is your data in very high dimension? So this dimension is super high, right? And, uh, but maybe there are just k Gaussians, I've drawn two, that explain it. That, that, that if, if, if the data is really drawn from those or something very close to that, that's what you'd like to know. So hypothesize that it is coming from a mixture model, and then the problem is to find them. So given samples without, so you're not being told, so you get to, you erase the, the actual, these boundaries that I've drawn, and then you want to know, you know, to what, what's the mixture it's coming from. So what do I mean by a mixture? There is a set of underlying distributions, perhaps a relatively small number of them, K, and then, uh, each of them has a weight, so that's the probability that the sample is coming from the first one, the second one. So these weights are non-negative, add up to one. And uh, so each component is, so I've, I've, we'll, we'll assume Gaussian for this talk, but it could be more general. This problem goes back uh, over 100 years. Uh, it was applied to real data to classify species. And uh, there are two variants of the problem you could consider. The first is classification, where you really want to separate the points according to which Gaussian they came from, the, the, the component of origin. Now that one needs some separation, right? So even in one dimension, if you had this Gaussian and this Gaussian, uh, you will certainly not be able to uniquely identify points that are in the overlap region. So if you want to be able to do that, you need some separation, and then you might be able to classify most of them correctly. Now you then, it, at first glance, it might seem, oh, the problem should be easy. If they're going to be separated, you'll be able to tell them apart. That's fine in one dimension. It is easy in one dimension if they're separated. But when you go to high dimension, most pairs of points are roughly at the same distance. So you'll need, you know, for this type of naive approach to work, we'll see in a minute, you need a very large separation, much larger than actually you would information theoretically need to, say, to, to be able to realize they're, they're separated. But the, the other variant is learning. What I, what I mean by that is, okay, so they, they overlap, so what? I just, I still want to learn the parameters. What are the means and the standard deviations of these Gaussians? I don't care if they overlap. <coughs> then you might ask, is that problem even well-defined? You know, maybe there are multiple mixtures which, ex which arise, give rise to the same data, and that, fortunately, is not possible for Gaussians. Gaussian mixtures are uniquely identifiable. So if you give me two descriptions of parameters, which are different in some part, maybe one of the means is different, or one of the variances is different, or one of the mixing weights is different, then there's a, there's a, there's a unique uh, fit to it. So that's nice. At least the problem is solvable in principle. <laughs> and indeed, there is a polynomial algorithm to learn a mixture of Gaussians up to any desired accuracy. Uh, this, uh, for two Gaussians, it was done by Kalai Moitra Valiant and Belkin Sinha, and then generalized to, to, to K Gaussians. Unfortunately, the sample complexity grows exponentially with the number of components. Um, we know that it must grow uh, at least as uh, 2 to the k. Uh, uh, this was in a paper by the two uh, younger valiants, and uh, uh, also in the original paper. Uh, but but uh, even more, perhaps, there is a lower bound that suggests that at least for lots of known algorithms, including the ones that are used to solve this upper bound, you, you need at least n to the k samples. Now, 
the reason I'm pointing this out is another nice thing that complexity can tell us is, yes? What is the, the, what is the dependence of dimension of the complexity? N. N is the dimension. N is the dimension, K is the number of Gaussians. And the sample? This is the total number of samples that this algorithm needs. And uh, you need at least two to the K for, for just information theory reasons, otherwise you won't be able to tell them apart. But it turns out that if you only consider statistical query algorithms, we'll, I might mention them a little bit later, there are a class of algorithms that includes things like PCA and stochastic optimization, convex optimization, and so on, uh, then uh, uh, you need n to, the, n to the K samples. We have recent results with less than this, with non-statistical algorithms. Okay. Great, yeah, super. What, what is the complexity? Uh, so, so it's, it's a kind of polynomial in K, but we use, we use uh, compression techniques. So we, we pick the points for compression representation of the, of the Gaussians. So there is some extra assumption on information being given. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so it remains open. So this could be useful for a small number of components. And whether the true complexity is polynomial in NK is still an open question. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah. In both N and K. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, yeah. Don't you have two to the K? Ah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, polynomial in N times function of K. Thank you. Yeah. Polynomial in N times function of K. That's. Uh, I removed the question, but it was on the slide. Is there a polynomial in N times function of K algorithm for this problem? Yeah. Uh, now, techniques, uh, and maybe maybe. Uh, the, the, these, these apply more generally than this particular problem. Um, the first uh, one is random projection. We see it everywhere in machine learning now. Um, the idea, posed only by Das Gupta, was you take this mixture of these points that are in very high dimension and project them down to a low, much lower dimensional space. And, uh, and then in that lower dimensional space, let's just use some kind of um, uh, distance-based separation. Okay. We'll get back to them. Now, the, the one nice thing about projection is that it will preserve the distances between most pairs, or it will scale them all down proportionally. In particular, if the means of these Gaussians were separated, they'll remain separated. Uh, by, or at least they're, 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 they'll remain proportionally separated. That, that's not enough to solve this problem. However, this idea, originally due to Kalai, and that was used in, in these papers, uh, says the following. So you have this, uh, this, this mixture in, in, in high dimension. Uh, I'm going to project it. So, so we make no assumption on separation now. It's just a mixture of Gaussians, points from a mixture of Gaussians, somewhere up there. I'm going to project it to a randomly chosen line. It's one dimensional projection. Project everything to a randomly chosen line. Well, you know, Gaussians project to Gaussians. The projections are still Gaussian. So you're going to get some mixture of Gaussians, whatever they are. Now, if I could, let's assume that I can solve the problem in 1D. In 1D, K Gaussians, we know they're uniquely identifiable. Let's assume we can solve them so in, in, in time polynomial in, in uh, 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 yeah, in N, certainly. This, it's not, okay. Now, okay, so you've got something about this. You know which projection you applied. You applied a particular projection matrix, R1. You've got this data. You've learned the means. Well, let's do it again and again. Do it for a whole bunch of projections. For each of them, now you're getting a system of equations, right? Because the original means are getting projected, and you know what the projection mean is. The original means are getting projected, you know what the projection means. We've got a whole bunch of equations. If you've got enough, you can solve them. Almost there, not quite. Because we don't know which mean corresponds to which gas. Every time you do it, it could flip. So, so the idea is that, that it is, let's just take one random line. But then we consider a few lines that are slight perturbations of it, and then project onto all of those. Each time you'll get slightly different means. They're linearly independent perturbations. And now you've got a system of equations. You can assume that the first Gaussian appears before the second, before the third, because your perturbation is very small. OK, that's, that's, that's the idea. Now, we're left with the problem of solving in 1D. We still have the problem of solving in 1D. That turns out to be quite uh, non-trivial. The idea of using random projection is now uh, quite general. You can use it for supervised learning as well to, to reduce sample complexity and so on when there are margins, for example. Uh, so to do it in 1D, Pearson already, Pearson already realized that you know, once you have a finite number of moments, if you, if you can come up with a 
Gaussian mixture so that it agrees with the sample on a finite number of moments, you know, first moment, second moment, third moment, some finite number, then you, you, you will have uniquely identified it. And sort of the key result in this kalai moitra paper is that six moments suffice. If you can match it on f six moments, yes? You might not preserve distances when you project all the way to one dimension. Uh, um, you won't preserve every pair, but all we care about are the means. Because that's all you're trying, the means and the covariance matrix, which is you know, n squared times k information. You can take more samples than that. And, uh, and, and, and yeah. OK. This is without any separation assumptions? Yes, everything, this, this, that's right. No, sub, no, this is just learning. So yeah, we're really learning the Gaussians, yeah. Yes? If we want to apply this you know, to brain learning, then probably brains have to learn in online manner, right? Do any of these results also have implications for online learning? Uh, so the, the data points are coming one at a time, perhaps? Right, yeah. um, let's see. Uh, you can certainly do things like random projection online because it's data independent. Now, uh, but then there is a part where you're solving these linear systems. I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Yeah. Um, it, it, yes. Sorry. Yes. So uh, when you perturb the lines, and you're hoping that the order of the Gaussian is not changing. So, uh, oh, so yeah, means yeah. Means. Intuitively, that depends on the separation. So, like, if, if the separation is smaller, you need a, you need a smaller perturbation to. Ah, uh, right. Uh, uh, yes. So, so it depends on the epsilon that you're assuming for those two. But you know, you could even have two. Some of the Gaussians have exactly the same mean, right? So, the, after all, you're going to learn. You want to learn to some epsilon. Okay. That means you want to learn each parameter, the means, the variances, to to to, to that epsilon. If the means are closer than that epsilon, I don't care if they're switched. Okay. Yes? Do you assume that you know the weights? No, no, you don't. You don't How can you have six moments? Shouldn't it depend on the number of. Yes, yeah, six is for two Gaussians. Oh. Yeah, so it grows with the number of uh, components, yes. Oh. Um, I think the, the, the precise, uh, uh, it's, it's, still, uh, it's still unknown what the right answer is. Uh, six, we can show you can't do better than that. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, um, I believe it's polynomial in. Uh, no, 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 no. Does anybody know the answer? Is it? Uh, I'll, I'll have to. I, I don't want to give you the wrong answer, whether it's. Uh, uh, it was for the fixed sign, but I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, the, my, my only question is, is it polynomial in K or exponential in K, the number of moments with K? And uh, I want to say it's polynomial, but, but, but let, let me check. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, I was just going to say, so the yes. number of moments, which in this case is six, probably is going to appear in the exponent of something like the number of samples you need. Yes. So even six is just a kind of scary big number because it means like something. Okay, good, good. It, it it is polynomial in K, but continue. Yes, <laughs> it, because this number appears in the exponent. That, that's all I need. Good. Yeah. Because you know to compute the kth moment, you need n to the k, uh, two to the k type of samples, it, even in one dimension. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now that was the first part, right? Okay. So this was doable, but with this huge cost, both samples, data, and and computation. So well, let's start assuming that the means are separated, you know, that the Gaussians are actually pulled apart somewhat. You say you could assume means are separated, and then I'll, I'll, I'll discuss this in more detail. Or you could assume something weaker, that each Gaussian is separated from the span of the rest. You don't have to be that every pair is far away. Or, uh, or perhaps uh, even weaker, and these are assumptions under which there are interesting provable results, that the matrix of, uh, of means has a, a, a bounded smallest singular value. In other words, they're not linearly dependent. Now, the, the means the, are not all lying in a lower dimensional space uh, or close to one. OK, so the techniques for this, when you assume separation, are basically principal component analysis in various guises. Just use it, use it twice, 
or reweight and use it. And we'll see what I mean by this. And so since many of you have probably used principal component analysis at some point, here's some, a couple of things we can actually prove using it for, for, for unsupervised learning. So just to remind you, with points in high dimensional space again, what do you mean by principal component analysis? You know, the, 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 uh, the first principal component is the one dimensional line through the origin that simply minimizes the sum of square distances. So that's, that's an interesting and uh, um, perhaps not so commonly known way to think about it. If I have a whole bunch of points in whatever dimensional space and I want to know what's the top principal component of this, it's going to be the single line through the origin that minimizes the sum of square distances. <coughs> That's the top principal component. And then the second one will be the line orthogonal to this that does the same thing and so on. So uh, uh, now this, this uh, gives us a couple of things, the fact that it's the sum of squares. First, that uh, you can use a greedy algorithm to find the best k-dimensional subspace, where uh, you find the best one, a project orthogonal to that, find the next best one, and so on. And uh, you can compute this very efficiently through singular value decomposition. It's sort of the, the, one of the core components of numerical analysis, doing this very efficiently. Uh, and it's been done for decades now. OK. So just to have a picture for a Gaussian, the comp principal components will be the axis of this, this ellipsoid, right? The, okay. Um, now, why? Why do you want to do it? Well, of course, it reduces space because you're going to k dimensions instead of n dimensions, k, if you're using k components. But sometimes it reveals interesting structure, so that's perhaps the so reason. Yes? <coughs> what problem are we solving for this here? We will solve the Gaussian um, k. k. Yeah. Separated. Separated, yes, under various assumptions using variants of this. Exactly. Yeah, We're still with the Gaussian mixture problem. Uh, uh, so it has a history for centuries, and it's used everywhere, all kinds of fields, even the hippocampus. I I'm joking. <laughs> but uh, the, the, uh, the, so, so let, before we use PCA, let's try something more naive, just based on distances. Uh, now you think that points, you know, if you're in one Gaussian, points from one Gaussian should be closer to each other than points from another Gaussian. Um, in principle. And then what you could do is pick a point, take all the points near it, that's one cluster, and then pick another point, all the points near it, it's another cluster, there's your clustering algorithm. But the trouble is that the separation that you need for such an algorithm that's purely looking at distances, not this specific one, but any algorithm that only looks at distances, pairwise distances, grows with the dimension. It grows as a polynomial in the dimension. So even though you just have two Gaussians that, are that, that you know that all you need is separation that's basically the standard deviation in that direction, uh, if you're going to use pairwise distances, you'll need separation that's roughly n to the quarter times the standard deviation. And you can't avoid it. So just using distances cannot work. So the idea is, let's project to the top k principal components for a k Gaussian mixture, and then apply distance-based classification. Why should this do any better? So now, instead of separation that grows as the uh, n to the quarter, if you preserve this, you know, what the algorithm will do is that the separation will only grow as k to the quarter, where k is the, the number of Gaussians. So rather than the ambient dimension, it's the number of components that that tells you what this is. This is for spherical Gaussians. And the key um, observation here that makes this possible is that, um, you know, suppose you're talking about just two Gaussians. You know? The two Gaussians, the only thing I need to tell you is the line joining the means. If I were to tell you the line joining the means, you would project the Gaussians to that line, and then you'd have these two one-dimensional Gaussians that are separated. And you'd, be, you'd, you'd solve the problem. How do you find this line? Well, it's the, it's the line is a span of their means, right? The two means. Or the line joining the means, let's say the origin two. If you have k Gaussians, I'd like to know the, the k-dimensional span of the k means. Because then you could project there. Clearly, the distance between the means will not change. Meanwhile, your Gaussians, which are n-dimensional and huge, every pair of points is really far away, are now shrinking down to k-dimensional Gaussians. OK, that would be great. How do I find this subspace spanning the means? PCA. Just take the top k principal components, nothing else. And then, uh, 
since, um, since Christos didn't use any of his proof credits, I'll, I'll do a proof. Okay, so if I had just one Gaussian, uh, what would be the single best line? I have one Gaussian in space somewhere, and I want to find the single best line, the line that minimizes the sum of square distances. What will it be? Sorry? You know, but, but you know, uh, it will be the line through, the, through its mean, right? Just by symmetry. It's a spherical Gaussian. It'll be the line through its mean. Great. So, that, so that's, that's what PCA will do. Uh, what would be the best k-dimensional subspace for a single Gaussian? It's only one Gaussian still, but I want the best k-dimensional subspace. So I get to pick, a, you know, not one, but say two, three, k. Well, what will be the best one? Yeah, but what will it be? I have one Gaussian sitting there, spherical. Here's the origin. What should I pick? Any k-dimensional subspace going through the origin, right? There's lots of them. Any k-dimensional subspace going through the origin, that's the best you could do for one. Great. What is the best for k Gaussians? <coughs> Each one of them wants this subspace to go through their mean. But you've got k dimensions, so you can go through all their means. So that's the answer. It will go through all their means. And once it goes through all their means, you're in great shape, because now you project there, and you, your Gaussians shrink, and now your distances that you need is only k to the 1 fourth. Is there any fundamental reason why you restrict k to be lower than the number of dimensions? No, no. This, this algorithm would not be useful, would not be interesting otherwise. But oh, is there any f uh, mathematically fundamental? Uh, no. But probably in practice, you could argue that models that have fewer components are more interesting. But, but certainly the case when there are Lots of components is also interesting. Yeah. It relies on, on the Gaussians being spherical. Yes, so far, yes. Yes. It works slightly more generally. Uh, I, I, I took that slide out. You, what you need is not that they are Gaussians even, but that their covariance matrix is, uh, is a multiple of the identity. So you need the distribution to look like a white end decorrelated distribution, each of the components. Okay. Now, you could do this more generally without this assumption that of spherical Gaussians, let's say general Gaussians. But then the separation that you need for this type of you know, PCA-based algorithm to work grows, still k, but it grows with the largest standard deviation of the Gaussians. Not the you know, spherical Gaussian, there's only one. Here it grows with the largest one. Okay? Not, uh, so in other words, you have to basically draw a ball around each Gaussian, and these balls should mostly not overlap. That's, that's, that's what you need for this to work. Now, there is work, just to mention, since k-means comes up so much. It's used a lot in heuristic, but this is one of the few theorems that I know about it. Um, you could do the same thing. Apply PCA, and then rather than running this distance-based thing, use a k-means type algorithm. In case you haven't seen, you know, k-means is this, we want to cluster a set of points. You start with some clustering, partition. Each of the parts computes their mean. Those are the means. Now you reassign the points to the closest mean, okay, and then recompute the centers, repeat this till it stabilizes. Um, it's used a lot. We, people analyze how many iterations. Very hard to say anything about the quality of what you get, except in this case, where under some assumptions that I won't mention, these are deterministic assumptions, nothing to do with, doesn't have to be Gaussian mixtures. Uh, you, you have to make, assume something about points and the, how far apart their means are. This method, actually converges and, and gives you the, the right clustering. It's proved by Kanan and Kumar. And it's crucial that they apply the PCA before running the k-means. If you just apply PCA on this original data, it doesn't work. But if you apply PCA, then it probably works. OK, so uh, of course, PCA doesn't work all the time. And most of the time, it doesn't work. And here's why. It's not a fine invariant, of course. I mean, it's trying to pick the long directions. So what I mean by that? is, like in this example, if you have Gaussians like that, that are um, clearly separated, but uh, in a direction in which they're narrow. Now, what happens in this case? What will be the top principal component? Right? It's, trying to, it's a line that minimizes the sum of square distances. So it'll be a line like this. And so, in fact, you'll start picking up those. It doesn't help. What you want is a line like this, so that when I project there, I get, I get these two separated. So just by squeezing them, you can destroy PCA. So if, if, if your data had a linear transformation applied to it, no good anymore. 
And it's not noise tolerant either. To destroy PCA completely, for if you're using K components, you just need K bad, K strategically placed points. They can completely destroy it. So both of these are, are serious uh, bottlenecks, even in, not only for neuroscience, but even in machine learning. And uh, so a situation like this, where it works, once you transform it to this, it doesn't work. So uh, what, however, the right assumption in some sense is not that they are, the means are separated, because that's not a fine invariant, but that the components are probabilistically separated. In other words, uh, the probability that a given point is from one Gaussian dominates. It's, it's most, uh, very likely it's from this Gaussian, and then with a tiny probability it might be from the others. So you know, the overlap of the actual uh, probability densities is extremely small. That's, that's the assumption. So which, which, will, which remains true, with, that is a property that's a fine invariant. Right? You squeeze, you, it doesn't change the fact that the probability distributions don't overlap. So it seems to be the right thing. PCA is not. And so here is an isotropic or a fine invariant version of PCA. The, the first step is make the distribution a fine invariant. What, by that I mean make it isotropic. So take your distribution, the data, whatever it is, compute its covariance matrix. Maybe the covariance matrix is, is, not, uh, is not spherical. Convert it to a spherical covariance matrix so your data gets transformed. So now your covariance is the identity. PCA by itself will tell you nothing. And then you're going to reweight points so that points that are further away get lesser and lesser weight. Just the weights are, themselves are Gaussian. And now you see, has your mean shifted because you've reweighted? If it has, that direction is going to be very important. You'll use it to cut and recurse. If the mean hasn't shifted, maybe because they are balanced components, take the top principal component, project on that, and recurse. Okay, so it's a combination of PCA and, and this uh, recursive transformation. And just to show you, the, the, what, what does isotropic transformation do? You know, these are separated but very narrow. So of course it, it pulls them apart. These look like this. They're narrow in other directions. It, it makes, this is just whitening, as some people call it, or uh, what you call decorrelation. Okay? Now, uh, so it, it, it does this, but now you're done. You can't use PCA anymore, right? Every direction is the same, equally good, by definition. So, and this is what I just described. If some component is heavier, then the new mean shifts along a separating direction, and if, if not, the reweighted principal component is along a separating direction. And this is provable. So if you have a mixture of k arbitrary Gaussians now, under the assumption that each one is separated from the span of the rest, uh, this algorithm, recursive algorithm, actually works. And it's polynomial in n, k, and, and the other parameters. It's not clear if we can extend this to something more general than mixtures of Gaussians. This is specifically for mixtures of Gaussians. When you say span of the rest, you mean the span of the... The means. The means. Just span of the means. Each mean is separated from the span of the other means. So to show you, this, you know, these are mixtures of Gaussians, the experiments you can trust. <laughs> you can generate Gaussians and trust them. So here's the original data. It's in 40 dimensions, but I you know, projected to, to I, I'm picking, showing you the two dimensions in which the means were separated. But of course, the algorithm doesn't know that. And so if you do a random projection, of course, everything gets combined. If I do a principal component analysis, no better. I mean, it looks maybe worse. And then if you do this isotropic PCA, it'll pull them apart. Okay, so uh, just to finish off this module or this section, uh, uh, an extension that's important that I haven't dealt with is learning noisy distribution. So what if your data is mostly from a Gaussian or mostly from a mixture, but 1% is not? What can you do? Uh, uh, in general, this agnostic learning, and of course it's of interest in supervised learning as well. And uh, in, in, in recent work, over the past uh, couple of years, uh, for many of these problems, uh, uh, the answer is yes. For others, it's still open. So there have been some developments on how you can remove outliers and how you can deal with arbitrary noise, small levels of it, in these type of generative models. So, so can you say what, what is the results for agnostic when you have no assumptions, but you just want to find the best mixture? Yeah, so, so, so the problem is already interesting even for one Gaussian. So suppose you have, your data is coming 90% 90, 90 from one Gaussian and 10% arbitrary. Okay, uh, you want to estimate the mean and variance of the true original Gaussian. So if your noise rate is some eta, 
you can estimate the mean to within 800 times the standard deviation. And you can do it in polynomial time, and that's the best you could do with any algorithm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, for mixtures, it's still not clear. The algorithms that I presented to you uh, don't quite extend yet, but that could be a matter of we don't fully understand it. There's no lower bound yet. Okay, so we have finished the first one. Um, uh, uh, in case you're worried, these will go faster. Um, I, I thought I should do the first one in some detail. So um, you saw some algorithms and the type of analysis. So we'll move to a second model for unsupervised learning, which has shown up a lot and actually multiple times in neuroscience uh, uh, for analyzing various things, from, including fMRI data. So here's the model. Um, you start with the product distribution. So there's a bunch of variables, uh, and each variable's value is generated independently from some distribution. Let's say, in this case, uh, an interval. And then there's a linear transformation applied. But you don't know this transformation. Right? So somebody applies a linear transformation, and then you're given the data. So what you're saying is a linear trans unknown linear transformation of a product distribution. Right? So points from some unknown, in this case, parallel pipette. But it could be something else. And the problem is find this transformation. Right? What was the transformation that led to you seeing this data? Sorry, one dimensional distribution. <laughs> yeah, it's a product, product of one dimensional distributions. That's the, yeah. Now, can this problem be solved? I mean, is it actually well posed? I mean, in general, no, right? What if the components were Gaussians? Right? And the transformation was a rotation. Then, of course not, because rotated Gaussian looks the same. But that is the only way you, it might not be well posed. So, uh, oh, by the way, this, it's, there's a, the, the more general version is that it doesn't just have to be a, a, a linear transformation. It could be a full dimensional one. It could be any linear transformation. So it could be a, include a projection. So this data in this space that, uh, that I rotated and then projected onto some lower dimensional space, and you're only seeing the lower dimensional projection of it. So the matrix A doesn't have to be square or full rank. OK, so this is the problem. There is your original data, S, in some uh, space. Then there is this matrix A, possibly mapping to a different space. And you're seeing this data, X. And the components of S are generated uh, independently. So the theorem for identifiability is that this transformation is unique up to signs of the columns. So the columns, if you negate the entire column, you can't tell anything. As long as at most one of these components is Gaussian. If two components are Gaussian, again, you're in trouble, right? You will never be able to tell those apart, because you could just rotate in that two-dimensional space. You won't be able to tell them apart. But as long as all but one are not Gaussian, or maybe all are not Gaussian, then it's uniquely identifiable. You can figure it out. Yes? So just trying to learn the transformation, or you also try to learn what the original distribution was? Just the transformation. But then that allows you to pull apart the, the statistics of any one coordinate. And then you know, it depends how you want to learn the distribution, mean, variance, yeah. moments. Yeah. And you're, you're talking about the problem of identifying the parameters rather than coming up with a distribution that is close to this distribution. Right, right. In this case, though, once you've figured out the matrix A, yeah, OK, right. But you're right. You're, we're trying to figure out what is this, this hidden model A that, that's transforming your original data. This is a high probability statement. Does this system has any probability? No, no, there's no probability here. Uh, 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 because uh, you know, there's no data involved in this statement. It's like saying Gaussians are uniquely identifiable. Uh, of course, things can go wrong if you applied any particular sample. But, but the parameters cannot be from two different. So there are no two different matrices, A1 and A2, which would give you the same distribution. Yeah. Um, so this has been used for a long time. There's a famous paper by Bell and Sejnowski, which does uh, expectation maximization uh, for this. And they get good results in, in some practical scenarios. So apparently, it's part of fMRI uh, software routinely and so on. There are many attractive heuristics. It's kind of a fun problem. You know, how would you do this? You have a cube, but and uh, but now um, you know, uh, relatively recently we have uh, provable guarantees. Um, so the most general thing is that as long as the columns of A satisfy a weak <coughs> linear independence condition, it's much weaker than linear independence. So it could be. I'll tell you in a minute what it is. And the components are some distance from Gaussian. When I said not Gaussian, of course, it could, if, you, if it could be closer and closer and closer to Gaussian, it'll be less and less identifiable. So the problem has to depend on how close to Gaussian you are. 
And then you have to ask, how do you measure the distance to Gaussian? Uh, so these are all valid questions. But uh, the point is that as long as you are at some distance from Gaussian, you can, and, and you assume that the original matrix has some weak linear independence property, you'll be able to figure out the matrix up to any desired epsilon. And what do I mean by generalized linear independence? You know, take a matrix A, assume it has distinct columns. Not necessarily linear independent, but just distinct. Now, find the smallest power, right? And by power, I mean take each column. Uh, so if you have the column A1, you replace it by A1, out of product A1. Think of that as a column now, and so on. So it's growing in size every time. Now, at some point, as if you start with distinct columns, this will become linearly independent. You might have to go as many times as the number of columns, but it will become linearly independent. And look at the smallest dimension at which it becomes linearly independent. That's, that suffices. That's the D that's used. Anyway, so now for D equal to 1, which just means that you assume the columns are actually linearly independent. This is the case that's most widely studied. Start, you assume your matrix A is linearly independent. That's already been uh, uh, subject. Um, yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. There's a, this poly includes a, a D. I'm thinking of as a constant, but that polynomial uh, allows exponents in of D. Yeah, yeah. It's an it's an exponent. Yeah. Uh, so it's m to the D. Yeah. Uh, now, D equal to one linearly independent case. Um, um, I, I'll go to the techniques in a minute. Uh, uh, but already PCA, no chance, and, and, and so on, because the matrix A could have been a rotation, and then you get nothing from it. Uh, um, well, let's skip this. This works with Gaussian noise, and in very recent work, it actually works with a small amount of arbitrary noise. Uh, the techniques, maybe, maybe this is more interesting. PCA is useless, because it could be a rotation. But the following view, or generalization of it, is, 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 is useful. If you think of PCA as maximizing second moments, right, it's a direction that maximizes the second moment of the distribution. <laughs> Instead of second moments, maximize a higher moment, like the fourth moment. Now, that's a hard problem. Second moments, great, easy. We can do it in polynomial time. Just fourth moment, in general, points in space, it's a hard problem, even to approximate. However, for this problem, it's sufficient to go to any local optimum. In fact, the local optima are going to be exactly the vectors along the columns of A, if A is linearly independent. So this was already proven by uh, Fries, Jerome, and Kanon. Uh, and, uh, and the point is that uh, you can uh, think of this as a particular case of uh, tensor decomposition, and that leads to the more general algorithm. But, but, but basically, you're going to local optima of higher moments. <coughs> And even the local optima are already useful because you assume such structure in the in the in the in the in the, in the data. Okay, so that's uh, that's where we are now. Uh, by the way, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm leaving room for questions. You're welcome to ask more. Um, yeah. Um, the next topic I have in mind is finding planted structures. Uh, 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 I, I think this is also of, of relevance. And then we'll see clustering. OK, so plan, we, we saw click in the morning as an instance of an NP-complete problem, but also uh, the, as one that's hard to optimize. You, know, you can't approximate the click to, to a nearly linear fact in the dimension. Right? So there might exist a click of size uh, constant times n, and you can't even find one of size uh, uh, n over log cube n right now, and probably not even n over 2 to the root log n. So very hard to optimize. What if the graph was random, just random, GNP? Can you find the largest clique in this? You know, uh, uh, Christoph said that he knows this graph intimately. I would challenge him to find the largest clique. <laughs> I mean, he knows the size. <laughs> he knows its size. He knows the height of his friend, but not what he looks like. So OK, so, so it's, it's, uh, it's 2 log n. 2 log n. Okay? But uh, we, the, the best algorithms we know can only find a clique of size log n. And one of those is just take the largest degree and largest degree and largest degree and uh, go as far as long as you can go till you can have a click. That gives you log n. We, we cannot do better than two. We don't know how to find two log n. OK, maybe this is uh, a, a mathematical game. What if I plant in a random graph a much larger click? 
2 log n is the largest you'd expect. You can find, with high probability, there won't be one larger than that. Let me plant a, one of size k where k is much larger. So, so just to, about the, the hardness statement here, it's a combination of probabilistic and, I mean, we don't know a hardness statement. With high, with high probability, you have a click of size 2 log n. Yes. But you assume that now, now you're taking worst case? What, what, was, what is oh, that? So, so what, what is the problem? The problem is I give you a random graph. And with high probability over the choice of the random graph, I would like you to output a click of size 2 log n. I'll be happy if you go 1.01 log n. And we don't know how to do this. There is no hardness statement. There is no hardness uh, known. Yeah. Time? Yeah, in polynomial time. If you allow me n to the log n time, it's easy. Yeah. Polynomial time, yeah. Or anything less than n to the log n. Uh, so let's make it a little easier and maybe more relevant. Instead of just pure random graph, suppose there, are, there is a large clique in there that was planted adversarially in some place, and you would like to know, uh, find it, or at least detect that it's there. OK? So what is the size at which you'll be able to do this? And, and how do you do it? So that's the planted clique problem. Now, similarly, you can ask other ones. Take a random graph, introduce a partition, you know, where the density is lesser than the density in the rest. Can you find this partition? Right? Again, that's a uh, hard problem in the worst case. Planted assignment. So there is a constraint satisfaction problem or a satisfiability problem. And you're seeing all these clauses. Uh, and the clauses are random. Uh, but they are consistent with some assignment. Okay. Can you can you detect this? Okay. And can you can you find the find the find the assignment? Um, and then you could plant other things. I mean, you can plant all kinds of things. So it's, it's sort of a, a a way to model a problem. Yeah. Now here's the status for plant cliques. The, the end to the log n is 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 easy. Just find you know. This brute force search. Uh, if k is large enough, if k is actually uh, omega root n, then you can do it in polynomial time. Any constant, the constant can be any constant. You can do it in polynomial time. And, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see this algorithm. Uh, originally, you do Elon, Krivilevich, and Sudakov. And now it turns out that if k is a little bit less than root n, then at least for statistical algorithms, which I still haven't defined, uh, the complexity is n to the log n. So, so uh, if somebody finds an algorithm, it will be very interesting. It won't be statistical for one. For one. So, is there a polynomial algorithm for k any k less than root n, root n over log n? And I'm serious in asking the neuroscientists. I mean, they've solved multiple problems. So, it's anybody's game, really. So, techniques, combinatorial. This is the uh, one of the reasons we study problems in this field. So after all these algorithms for doing it for omega root n, here's Feige's algorithm. He said, uh, uh, just remove the lowest degree vertex uh, repeatedly. So remove the smallest degree vertex, look in the remaining graph, smallest degree, repeat this, till you get up to, well, you have to be a little bit careful at the end. You get to about 2k, and then you have to do something extra. But, but basically, that's the algorithm. Uh, but you could also do it spectrally, as in the original paper. So take the principal components of, this, of the adjacency matrix, which you build by putting a I mean, let's say 1 for edges and minus 1 for no edges. You know the graph. Put a 1 where there's an edge, minus 1 where there's no edge. And so what you see, this is the sample that you see, this is the graph that you see, looks like a clique that's planted there, plus a random graph. <coughs> right? That's what it looks like. And so and uh, the idea here is just basically take the top principal component and take the highest comp uh, uh, entries of that. And that will be mostly the clique. And then from those, you can build the rest. Why is that? So um, uh, 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 fundamental theorem of Friedrich and Komlosh, um, I'm missing the accent, but uh, it says that uh, the, for a pure random matrix, Bernoulli, but their theorem is much more general, any matrix with independent entries and, and say, bounded variance, the top eigenvalue, and the, 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 the spectral norm, is uh, 2 square root n. So a random matrix doesn't contribute much to the energy of, or to the top principal component of a, ma a matrix. So as long as your clique, this part, will have top principal component as much as the size of clique. 
if, if this is all ones here, k by k, the eigenvalue is k. So if k is larger than root n or 2 root n, you win. You'll start seeing that. That's the, that's the game. OK. Um, but that's basically the best known algorithm. Uh, similarly, uh, there's a similar story for planted uh, satisfiability or constraint satisfaction problems on, on even subsets of k variables at a time, k literals at a time. Information theoretically, n log n clauses suffice. You know, once you have n log n clauses, the assignment that could be consistent with these random clauses is unique. However, the best algorithms today require n to the k over 2 clauses. It's a huge gap, right? These are not NP-complete problems because you know, random instances, there's no, uh, we're in the random setting here. So how do I explain this gap? Information theoretically n log n, and if you give me exponential time, I can figure it out, right? Because I try all two to the n assignments. But, uh, but algorithmically, the best we know is n to the k over two. Uh, now, it turns out that, um, that for statistical algorithms, it's almost that, the lower bound up to a log, log n inside the exponent factor. And so again, uh, is there a faster method to detect whether uh, there's a planted assignment? Is that is an open question? And this is something that the, uh, uh, the algorithms have, uh, uh, have come from physicists. I mean, very interesting ones. OK, so here's the one slide or two slide version of why, why are we talking about statistical algorithms? Because there is a, some chance that they are relevant to the brain. I mean, Anything is, could be. Uh, so so the, the idea is just that instead of seeing explicitly examples, so let's say a learning problem, you don't get to explicitly see the examples, whether it's supervised or unsupervised, you don't get to see the examples explicitly. Rather, you can ask for the expectation of a function or for the function evaluated on a random example. So, um, uh, and so these are modeled by various oracles. We don't need to do the details right now. But basically, suppose I have all these examples that I want to know what is the average first coordinate. I can ask that. And I'll get back an error within some tolerance. Or uh, uh, I could ask, if I were to take an example, a random example, and multiply it by this, in, take the inner product with a particular vector v, so the expectation of x dot v, give me that value to within some epsilon. You can do that. Once you can do this, you can do all kinds of algorithms, approximately. There's only one that I know, which is actually useful for, a, you know, a, a solves a nice problem that we don't know how to do in this model, and probably cannot be done, and that's Gaussian elimination over finite fields, not not over the reals, over finite fields. So if you wanted to uh, solve linear equations mod two, and you're you're getting examples from some distribution, I don't know. It's, yes. Over here, you can. Yeah. Yes. Can can this simulate uh, sum of squares algorithm? Yes. You can solve, I mean, so you have to be careful how you define the problem. You can do convex programming. The point is that it's a, it's, the problem has to be over distributions, right? Because you're asking for a function of distributions. Suppose you're talking about stochastic, stochastic convex optimization. So there's some stochastic function where the objective function is an expectation over x's from some distribution. And there's a convex set there. Yeah, you can do that. So, so is the negative result implies the negative results for these SOS hierarchies? Not quite. Uh, it depends on, uh, yeah, yeah it, it, it does give some results. So, so this is a technical question, uh, uh, David. Uh, 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 what it implies is that, the, for example, let's say the sat satisfiability problem, uh, where you have a KSAT for distributions. What it implies is that the dimension okay, of any convex program that can solve them, so independent of statistical query, must be at least, in this case, we can prove n to the k over 2. OK, so, so these are, this, this class of problems, I think, is relevant. Could be interesting if you can define these. There's potentials for lots of algorithms, but also lower bounds, which complex classes. And now I'm at clustering, if you have the appetite for one more topic. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and so what is clustering? Uh, you, know, you want to divide into things that are similar. This is, again, a huge field, lots of uh, experts. Uh, uh, um, and what could the output be? It could just be a partition. It could be a hierarchical clustering. And maybe for each cluster, you also provide a list of features that, that distinguish that cluster from the rest, and so on. 
Uh, so the typical approaches are to optimize at some objective function. This has led to some very nice problems and results. So it could be the k-means objective function, which means that each cluster has a center, and you're trying to minimize the sum of square distances of the data points to their nearest center. That's the k-means objective function. But maybe you want to minimize the diameter of the, minimize the maximum diameter of the clusters that you find, or so on. And uh, these, these problems typically are already NP-complete, and NP-hard in the worst case, um, and even hard to approximate. But they've led to some very nice approximation algorithms and techniques which might work better on real data than the worst case suggests. Another approach is axiomatic, where you assume some assumptions on what it means for a clustering to be valid or the right one, something about the ground truth, so to speak. And then uh, you give algorithms that find that, given the data. That's what you uh, and then, of course, you can just apply one of these methods that's very general, like the k-means algorithm. Whether or not you want to uh, uh, use the k-means objective function, you could always use the k-means algorithm. Or you could use em in, in, in other ways, and so on. And of course, we have to understand how good is the solution, how efficient is the method, and so on. Perhaps most importantly, whether the clustering that you find is of any relevance. Is, is it the right one for this domain? Um, yeah, I mentioned this already. So here's a, one sort of uh, general approach. You have this graph, which is encoding pairwise similarities, let's say. The weight on the edge tells you how similar they are, uh, A and B are. And so let's partition this graph. Partition, partition, partition. You've got this tree built up, where the root is the entire graph, and the leaves are the individual nodes. And then given this recursive partition, this partition, let's find an optimal tree-respecting clustering, you know, one that your clusters have to be subtrees of this. Okay? Why? Well, because it's easier to optimize over trees. I mean, lots of things are much easier over trees. You could do dynamic programming. So this is the general approach. You start, you divide, and then you might do some merge, or you might basically stop dividing at some point, and that's, those are your clusters, in other words. OK, so, but then the question becomes, how do you cut? What's the right way to partition? There's no gen of course, there's no uh, universal answer. You could use a minimum cut. The one that seems to be particularly interesting is the sparsest cut or minimum expansion cut. And we'll, so I'll, I'll spend this, uh, this segment of time on that. Um, so in case you haven't seen it, you have this graph. And so the expansion of a subset is, the, is, is measuring its uh, neighborhood size relative to its size. Um, and if you have weighted edges, called the conductance, and it's the total weight from the subset to its complement divided by the smaller of the total weight incident to this subset and its complement. So you're measuring weight across divided by total weight. Okay, that's the conductance. And uh, you know, this was already introduced in a very influential uh, paper in uh, image segmentation by Sheehan Malik here. Uh, and it has lots of applications. I'll mention these. No, 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 the, the notion of conductance. And expansion. OK, so how to cut? Now, of course, this, this quantity is also NP-hard. We don't know. It, it seems so nice. You can play with it on um, data if you like, this, why, why this seems uh, so nice. You know, it's, it's saying you, you might have some few vertices that have very little degree to the rest, so you cut them off. But that's not so interesting. If I can get this cut in the middle, which really separates most of the 10% uh, of the graph from the rest, that's very interesting. That's telling you something. You know, uh, um, so we can approximate it to within a factor of log n, log of the number of vertices in the graph, using a linear program, to within square root log n using a semi-definite program, also an efficiently solvable convex program. And the one I'll talk about more here is using eigenvalues, where you can get the classical Fiedler cut gives you square root of the opt. So you don't incur any log factors, but you get square root of the opt. Uh, um, um, and this algorithm is extremely simple. We'll see it a couple of times. Take the second largest eigenvector of a, of a similarity matrix, but you have to take the similarity matrix and normalize it. I'll tell you how. Or uh, if you're more familiar with Laplacians, which I'll introduce in a second, then you take the, the second smallest. So this would be the second largest, otherwise the second smallest. And in any case, you sort, the, sort by, the, by, the, by the value of the component in this eigenvector. So this is the sorted order, the smallest to largest, say. And that suggests n minus 1 possible cuts. OK? 
take the best of those. Just take the best of these cuts in this order. And that already gives you a square root of opt. Uh, 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 it can't be any worse than that. Now, um, assuming such a cutting procedure, this, this, or this, any of these, what good is it for this? You know, you're repeatedly cutting, right? Not just once. You're going to recursively cut. You'd like a guarantee for the end result of clustering, not just the cut. That was the original problem. So suppose we had a cutting algorithm that each time, instead of giving you the best cut, gave you some constant times the cut to some power. <laughs> it's just a general way of writing it. Then, and you assume that there exists some clustering, alpha epsilon clustering. What do I mean by that? That the conductance of each cluster is at least alpha. So each cluster is really well connected. It's very hard to break off any subset of it without cutting off lots of edges. And moreover, you know, you, you, the total amount of edges you've cut is small. So you started with, maybe I should draw some things to, in my hands. Um, you start with something uh, um, that's uh, a graph. And it's, uh, um, you know, what is a good clustering? You're going to eventually, after cutting and cutting and cutting, you'll come up with some partition here. You'd like that each piece is really well connected. So the conductance within each piece is at least alpha. And the total weight of edges that you cut is at most an epsilon fraction of the total. So you've only sacrificed epsilon similarity to get these clusters that are all very tightly knit. That's the So assuming there exists some alpha epsilon clustering, alpha and epsilon are numbers between 0 and 1, then just this recursive partitioning using whatever library routine you had for getting one cut at a time will give you something that's comparable in, 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 uh, in conductance to the existing one and comparable in how many edges you cut to the existing one. In particular, if you do the recursive spectral partitioning, just this Fiedler vector spectral partitioning, you're going to get alpha squared over log n quality of clusters and 2 square root epsilon log n for the total number, amount, fraction of edges wasted. This, this new is... New? This new, what, what, what? No, it's an old result. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it, it, oh, so it's a number smaller than one? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a fraction of edges, and conductance is always smaller than one, because it's the yeah, yeah. way, yeah. Yeah. Uh, OK, so going back to this expansion statement, any, any, any questions? Uh, welcome. Uh, this was the definition of, uh, of the conductance of a set. And then we had the minimum of the entire graph. And I already mentioned the complexity uh, from a lower bound side and from the upper bounds. Now, a fantastic open problem is to prove anything better than this. We don't know if. Oh, are we out of? OK. We are, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but I can stop now if you. <laughs> OK. So. <laughs> um, uh, so can you show that uh, that it's NP-hard to compute uh, the sparsest cut or this uh, conductance to a factor uh, better than 1.01? It's open. We don't know. Unlike clique, which is very hard to compute, or other problems for which, say, a factor of 2 is difficult, here we don't know 1.01. Uh, OK. So eigenvalues, just a small detour on eigenvalues, because these have become very useful, especially in the segment of algorithms that are seen to be approaching practicality for large data sets and so on. Uh, we have some adjacency or similarity matrix A. It's weighted. And each row has a degree, just the total weight on that row. And the one nice thing to do is to just normalize it in this way, uh, degree to the square root, degree to the square root. And uh, uh, in particular, for D regular graphs, so if, if it's just 0, 1s, so where everybody had the same degree in the beginning, this is just scaling to make the row sums 1. But doing it this way keeps the matrix symmetric. Okay. Now, the Laplacian, or normalized Laplacian, is a sort of a negation of this. It's the identity minus this. It's convenient to work with this identity. So if you want to think about this, think of a regular graph. Uh, all the, every vertex has the same degree. And so we've normalized it, so every entry is 1 over d now. And I'm taking identity minus this. The diagonal is 1. Everywhere off diagonal, for every edge, I have a minus 1 over degree. Where there are edges and zeros where there are no edges. That's the matrix. Now this matrix is, uh, has several nice properties. Uh, a couple of them are that uh, the smallest eigenvalue is 0. 
and it's the smallest, so it's, it's a positive semi-definite matrix. And uh, the, the eigenvector for zero is, the, is proportional to the square root of the degrees. Now, that's, uh, this is uh, uh, just saying what the second eigenvalue is. It, 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 it has this nice form. The second eigenvalue is this ratio of uh, the difference between the eigenvector entries at two adjacent nodes, weighted, and, and normalized by sum of all their squares. So, OK, so this is just set up. Now, if the second eigenvalue is also 0, it must be the case that the graph is disconnected. There's no other way. If and only if a graph is connected, if and only if lambda 2 is greater than 0. And otherwise, it's, it's this guy. OK, so then this suggests, what if it's close to 0? Then does this mean that it's close to disconnected? In other words, is there a small cut? that separates into two components. And that's the fundamental theorem of Cheeger and Alon Millman that says that, indeed, the conductance, this expansion of the cut, is between the second eigenvalue and its square root. So if it's really small, you will find a cut whose conductance is very small. You will find they exist. They exist, but you'll also find it. And here's the algorithm. <laughs> the proof of existence is through this algorithm. And it's a... Uh, it's just uh, sort the components of the second eigenvector and consider the n minus 1 cuts, take the best one. Okay. Um, and basically use Cauchy Schwartz. In case, you know, after this week of uh, wonderful talks, you're itching for a proof, <laughs> here is the complete proof of the upper bound, the lower bound is easy because any cut uh, you can put it down. Would you like to go? Oh, no, okay. So, um, uh, so, so it's, it's useful in lots of places, this thing. And uh, yeah. Uh, now you could ask, you know, just to give a flavor of an extension, 2 sounds great, I want k. You know, I don't want to recursively cut for k, I want to find k, because there exists k in my graph, maybe. Right? So how to define it? The definition itself is not so bad. This k-way expansion is... Uh, you know, for each subset, suppose I partition into k subsets, for each subset, look at the expansion, so the edges that go out versus it. And then you take the, the maximum over the k subsets, and you'd like to minimize that. So find the cut that minimizes the maximum separation among these. So, um, you could define other ways. This seems to be the most uh, natural way. Now let's go back to, to Peron Frobenius again. Suppose the first k eigenvalue, not two, but k eigenvalues are zero. That can only happen if the graph has at least k-connected components, if and only if. So your k eigenvalue 0 means k-connected components. So this suggests, what if lambda k is close to 0, which of course implies that the other ones are also close to 0, do you get a nice cut? Is there a Cheeger inequality for this? This question was first asked, uh, as far as I know, to me by, by Luca Trevisan, one of the people running this institute. Um, and, uh, and here's the theorem. It says uh, that, yes, uh, uh, this k-way expansion is also related to the, uh, not to lambda k, but something slightly higher than lambda k, times, times root log k. And this relationship is tight. If k is 2, it's, it's a Cheeger inequality. But, uh, but even, even in, for general k, it's tight. So you get k disjoint subsets, each with small expansion. Or you can get lots of subsets with uh, so the sub the, the the index 1.01k means it, it is an, an integer, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What I mean is, uh, you could. You, uh, I'm using 1.01, but it works for any 1 plus epsilon. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, alternatively, you can say you get as many subsets as you wanted, a little bit less, but with exactly lambda. <coughs> okay. So, uh, just at a high level, what do these algorithms look like? Okay, maybe that guarantee is not so interesting, but the algorithm might be. First step, you're going to embed to the top k eigenvectors. Second step, and this is another step that's used a lot in approximation algorithms and combinatorial optimization, uh, you're going to, we're, we're going to partition these, these, the, the, the vertices of the graph into k-ordered sets by a randomized rounding. I'll show you that in a second. And then once you get k-ordered sets, we'll apply Cheeger's algorithm to each of the subsets. So first step is the spectral embedding. And that just means the following. First, I've taken the top k principal components. Those are the vertices of the graph, the original rows of the matrix. And we can think of this as an embedding right away, right? Principal, that's, that's what, those are the 
the, the vectors representing each, each row. Now you pick random Gaussian vectors <coughs> separately. And you project each of your vectors, you have now vectors in kinematic space, to, to each of these uh, East Gaussians. And you're going to assign it to that Gaussian, which maximizes the, the, the magnitude, the closest one in, in absolute value, so in, in an angle. And that gives you a partitioning, and then you just run Chi yourself. OK, so that completes sort of this uh, selective survey of methods in, uh, in, uh, in um, unsupervised learning for which we have provable guarantees. Um, so, <laughs> any, uh, Otherwise, I'll, I have a few more slides on uh, a couple of things uh, from recent times. Yes? Uh, you brought up measuring distances between distributions. How do you usually do that? Right. Um, there are many ways. Uh, so one that seems to come up a lot is something called the KL divergence which measures uh, how different they are. But you could, you could use um, a more uh, you know, a total variation distance, which is uh, maybe more basic. It's just uh, for each point in the support, you're looking at the difference between the densities assigned and adding up the absolute values, yeah. Does the metric have any influence on the results? Absolutely, yeah. It's a huge influence on how you, yeah. The input to all the algorithms that you've talked about was either a graph or a, some sort of point set, which you could do as a degenerate graph. Yes. Is it always easy or obvious to encode every problem into that kind of, of input format? Or, or is it possible that there are problems where, where there's even a non-polynomial step that has to be done just to get it uh, into a suitable form yeah. for solution? I mean, these are the predominant ways to address most problems. But uh, certainly, I, I don't know the answer to your question about whether getting into this form is, a, is, is sometimes hard. But I do know that there can be data that doesn't fit in this. For example, your graph is changing, you know, and, and, and you want to cluster some kind of time dynamics. Yeah. Um, I certainly haven't addressed that. Uh, uh, now, in principle, you should be able to embed everything as points in, in a sufficiently high dimensional space. Um, whether it's useful to do that is a, is a, is a different uh, question. Yeah. David, what, what, uh, you just mentioned graphs that change that have temporal dynamics. Yeah. Uh, what's sort of the nature of the temporal dynamics? Like changes in the edge weight or addition of nodes? Or yeah, both of those things, yeah. Yeah, I mean, think of the connectome. Right, right. Yeah. And then maybe you want to classify the nodes of the connectome based on their temporal behavior. So there's, there's theoretical work that No, <laughs> no uh, I'm not aware of, uh, of uh, I'm it's, sure there is. Uh, like a very interesting yeah. So all the algorithms here that you presented are in order to use them in, on data that you have on the brain, or you want to say something that our brain can have, like what it does have some sort of similarity, because I'm not sure the, yeah. about the purpose of Oh, why, why this talk? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a good, good question, yeah. No, no, it's, it's, I, I, I've asked myself that multiple times. Um, we know so little about the brain, we might as well talk about something we know something. About. No, but the, the reason is that uh, methods are uh, perhaps uh, suggestive of uh, what's possible and what's not possible. You know, you have, the brain is supposed to be solving all these problems. I don't know precisely what problem, but it's solving amazing problems. And here are some ways to solve some interesting problems, which are not so far away, at least in setup. So OK, you're not going to run PCA, but you might run uh, some kind of iteration that converges to the result of that. Mm -hmm. Like we saw in uh, the end of uh, in Bruno's talk, where you know, there's this objective function. It's not even convex. Uh -huh. um, but evolution could possibly potentially do it, because it's just a local search. OK, yeah, my question was just to understand if it's like to use these algorithms on a lot of data that we have on neuroscience, or actually to mean? I'm more interested in the latter, but uh, absolutely use them for neuroscience, yeah. Uh, no, no, I'm also yeah. interested in the latter. I just to <laughs> yeah. Just to comment, just, just to comment on this, I mean, the, the, I think there are two kind of hidden assumptions in, in the results. One type of results are results that assume some, general, some, some assumptions on the data. You assume that the data is partitionable with small cuts, there is no reason to believe that natural data has this property. Mm -hmm. And to get 
provable results, you have to make those assumptions. The, the other big question mark is, is the objective the real objective that you care about to cluster? Because if you cluster with one objective and you cluster with another <coughs> objective, you get completely different partitionings. Mm -hmm. And again, all this work is you assume one objective and then you investigate how to reach it. But there's not much work on which objective is suitable for your type of data. Mm -hmm. And I think probably no brains can only do this online, right? Now, how they can run several times over thousands of data, right? No inputs. I don't understand how this could work. So, uh, are there any work that like, some artificial circuits do these kind of models? Uh, do these, ki these kinds of algorithms, like, Simple circuits, simple neuron, neuronal... You mean artificial ones? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can implement any of these in hardware. Most of them are iterative, mm -hmm. so they're like simple loops. Uh -huh. That's one of the common features of all of these yeah. things, even the tensor methods and so on. Mm -hmm. they, they tend to be iterative. Yeah. So, okay. you know, there's a... Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But, uh, but uh, uh, yeah. I mean, certainly there are neural circuits that compute ICA. Yeah. I mean, that's what sparse coding is basically doing. So you can all do that with heavy learning. You say it happens in the brain. And, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that part, and same with mixture of Gaussians, mixture, mixture models at least. You can think of that in terms of like winner take all learning. That's kind of a poor man's version of it. Like right? neural networks that can do kind of uh, learn categories in a kind of you know, in a similar way. But, and then the questions of a different nature. You have the no online data. You have no guarantee what they come from. And now the question is now how good is your approximation going to be then, right? No, I think I don't see how to use provable things or even how to formulate provable questions about this online scenario. I mean, there is online clustering. There's, a, there's actually much literature on this because of the streaming model in computer science where you really assume data is coming in a stream. Uh, and let's say you want to do k-means or, or k-median on data that's just coming in a stream. You don't even, you know, you don't even know what order it's going to come in. And you'd still, nevertheless, at any point in at any point in the stream, you want to maintain k <coughs> points, which are meant to be as good as the k means or close to the best k means for the data so far. And this is there are provable guarantees for this. Yeah, but even though data so far is not something the brain can run. Right? No, no, no. The guarantee is on the data so far. The algorithm is constrained to be small memory. So this would be streaming. Yes, there's a lot, lot of literature on this uh, this type of uh, yeah. If you want to uh, maintain a clustering online. Uh, with small memory. So this is the streaming model, yeah. Can you talk a little, a little bit about the problem of missing data? So can we use these, these algorithms in, in a stitching way? So you're recording from some subset of neurons in one, exp in one trial, some other subset. Right. Yeah. It's a great question. Uh, uh, the techniques, yes. The, um, these models don't capture exactly that. But you know, we have this uh, matrix completion and uh, 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 problems. Um, which are exactly the type of thing you're asking about. You, know, you have some matrix, you see some entries, and you'd like to deduce the rest or deduce some property of the rest. Uh, uh, you might have heard of the Netflix problem. It shows up all the time. Matrix factorization and matrix completion. And these, for these problems, uh, similar techniques are used, in fact. The early ones for matrix uh, completion just use a variant of spectral methods. Um, now, they, they are based on some assumption, though. So you have to assume, for example, typical assumption is that the matrix from which you're seeing only a few entries is low rank or close to low rank. So, of course, you need to make some assumption, otherwise every entry could be. Can I ask another question? Yes. So is there any concept of, I change the problem a little bit, how much does the algorithm change? Because, uh, I mean, Robust. It, yeah. Stability or robustness, yeah. Yeah, but how would you define that mathematically? Because it, it happens at least to me personally a lot that I'm using an algorithm, something like ICA, and then I want to add, I don't know, some extra smoothness assumption in time, for example, on, my, on the components that I'm inferring. And I don't know really how to easily change the algorithm to just go and get I mean, the, 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 There probably but isn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just, no, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, I don't have a general answer. Certainly, they're, uh, they're, uh, uh, you know, agnostic learning is one attempt at this, where some of the data is for PCA, it can be done, right? It's being done, uh, sort of incremental uh, updates. Oh, yeah, online PCA. Yeah, but I think he's asking what if you change the assumptions of the problem? Oh, change the assumptions. Yeah, so you have like a bunch of data points. Let's say you have your ICA problem and you want the components that you're inferring from your ICA to be smooth in time. How do you do that? So your cost function completely changes from like, yeah. whatever yeah. process to something else, right? Yeah. Now, do you start over? Can you use the solution that you have from like a simple ICA as a, as a good initialization point? 
Is there anything known in that realm? I, 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 I wouldn't want to give you a general answer, yeah. Uh, I, I, I would bet there are problems for which such a small change may, transforms them to really hard, and uh, others for which, you know, uh, noise of certain types, or changes of certain types go through, so, um, yeah. Sorry. I'm just wondering, in the, the memory in the cortex, it has all these maps in, in two dimensions where you're trying to fit higher dimensions onto the two, and then the, you have some idea you want to tile the space, but you want the interconnections between similar um, neurons with similar properties to be small. That's, I guess, the feeling. I just wonder if, if that ever falls into your bailiwick, because it seems like it would be a graph. Sorry, so some pairs, you want them to be closer than other pairs? Yeah, you, for example, you have these orientation cells yes. at a position. Yes, so you want to find an embedding so, that preserves... So you know about that, and then, and yeah. so you have the two-dimensional space tiled, but then you have to fit in <coughs> all the orientations. And that seems like a graph problem to me. Graph embedding problem, yes. Certainly yeah. there's work on um, trying to embed uh, distances. You, you, you've got this graph, and let's think of what you're saying as distances. You know, These are closer, these are farther, and so on, between neurons. And you'd like to now realize this in a low-dimensional space so that the resulting embedding preserves these distances. Yeah. This, this, is a, this is a subject of much work, distance-preserving embeddings. And of course, as usual, we know things about what's the worst case you know, distortion that you might suffer, or how well can you approximate. But for, for yeah, sorry. But a lot, of the, a lot of the thinking is that you're trying to save wires, and so you're going to uh, connect like pairs, mm -hmm. and so you're trying to tile it in a way that saves wires. But I think, I don't know if in, in neurobiology, if it's actually known to the extent of, of the of the wire cost or what's connected to what, and so it could, it could be a formal problem. I'm wondering. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. It is, no, no, it is. It is a. If yeah, you have um, a parameter of, of yeah, the distance so that I, you're, you're willing to connect to, you will get different embeddings, and it seems I'm just trying to be friendly. Now, I would bet that the, specific, the the most immediate realize. So it's nice. We can take us through this exercise. So he's saying, you know, you want to take this graph basically, which represents the neurons and, yeah. their, and their similarities, and embed them in 2D, uh, with the additional constraint that you minimize, let's say, the total wire length, or, uh, uh, or or maybe just directly try to keep things that are closer closer in in, in the embedding. Right, and then yeah. of course there's data on this. So I'm going to see if I want if, if some yeah. algorithm you invent will tell me what's the um, just so connectivity yeah. is a function of the observed data. Yeah. So the starting point, I mean, we can probably safely assume this problem is NP-hard. Uh, 2D, <laughs> uh, probably, or we can tell Christos to do it by tomorrow because this, this, this but, that's but, a rock to hide but, but, that's not, that's not, that's no good, that's no good, I agree. So then, uh, yeah. Hardy sensitive hashing is, is doing something like in, that. Uh, in uh, log n dimension, he wants 2D. <laughs> right? I mean, uh, if we could do this in 2D, we can solve max cut, right? I mean, right. yeah. But the brain is 2D. Uh, 3D, isn't it? Well, it, <laughs> not that it makes it. Two, two and a half, because when, and you half. Go, when you go down, when, when you go down, the properties are preserved. Yeah. So it's somewhat. somewhat. <laughs> no, no, it's a, it's a great question, and, and if you come up with the right heuristic, who cares if what happens in the worst case? Uh, uh, right. I thought you were going to come up with the right heuristic. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. I, sorry, I didn't react uh, quickly enough. I wanted to address the previous question on robustness. There is a, there is a quite fascinating line of work in, uh, uh, in, in physics uh, coming under the name of chaos that shows that in many models, just a slight perturbation of the input changes dramatically the optimal uh, solution. And the max cut is one of the nicest examples of that. So if you look at the random graph, you'll then take a max cut, it's an optimal solution. You perturb the random graph a little bit, the new optimal solution is completely different. So this non-robustness is actually quite related to the complexity in finding the optimal solution. So it's not that. Okay. I, I actually remember, sorry to interrupt, so I actually remember there is uh, another example of this. So if you think of the case of the, the objective functions that you want to change them, let's say, by like a penalty smoothly, let's say, by increasing the penalty gradually, right? Then the solution will take a path that you can prove, in some cases, it is continuous. For example, in compressive <coughs> sensing, if you increase the L1 penalty, there is this homotopy method, right? That Justin Romberg has introduced. That you can that basically gives you the solution path, going from the original objective function that you had, plus 
like the penalty gradually how it changes. So I was wondering, when I asked the question, I was wondering if, if there is something similar, let's say, for ICA. Yeah. <coughs> right, that's maybe, maybe offline, but that method actually runs into the, the, into the obstacles precisely where the complexity of the problem kicks in in some sense, in, in, in the compressive sense. <coughs> So my question is, uh, what about graph clustering problems? So the graph is so big that you cannot even write down Good. a graph. Yes, so, uh, there are there are um, um, serious efforts to to, to address this. Absolutely, I mean, but we, this is a familiar problem, like with the internet or the uh, at different levels and so on. So people have uh, talked about uh, uh, local graph clustering, or um, uh, uh, where the the idea is that you're exploring a graph. Uh, uh, and all you're able to keep in memory is uh, some small number of nodes and edges. And so, based and of course other statistics, based on this, you want to decide when to cut off uh, pieces and call it a cluster and so on. So this is a, certainly a, 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 a topic of, um, of interest now, with some results. There, are some, there, is some, there is some very nice theory. So for example, algorithms like PageRank, which Google uses, and related ones, uh, there are local versions of these, which to the extent that what you can prove about page rank, you can almost prove about, about this. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I guess I was, I was wondering, if, if it turns out that the brain and neural circuits are using one of these methods to do some sort of computation, you illustrated a number of situations where the algorithm breaks down and you start to like lose the ability to compute. Yes. Are there corresponding like psycho, uh, you know, like psychological <laughs> inputs or disturbances to the input that you can maybe think of to like try to explore whether or not those are valid computations? Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Inputs that just break the algorithm. Right. You, somebody pushes you off the cliff, and that's it. Then. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. um, uh, clearly, you're not interested in my neural uh, <laughs> effort, so let's continue. Yeah. No, okay. So, so uh, I, I think we are at three o'clock. So I will just flash through these slides you know, because they're uh, th the one uh, I want to say is uh, uh, a paper with Christos where we introduced this notion called predictive join, which represents something that fires when both A and B fire. But by just building this in a sort of uh, uh, um, decentralized brainless way, it then creates um, high-level concepts which fire exactly when the same pattern that fired in when it was created is presented. Okay, it's, <laughs> it's a, a very quick summary. And it allows you to share substructures when you build multiple patterns, when you're memorizing multiple patterns, provably. What's uh, important here, maybe interesting here, is that learning happens quickly, sharing as we predict, but ma the majority of the traffic in this algorithm is downwards. Now, there's this question of why is feedback useful at all? And to solve even just memorization of n-bit patterns, it seems that, uh, that downward or feedback is crucial. At least we don't know how to do it without that. And the basic unit we're suggesting is a unit that if A and B fire, it fires, but if only one of them fires, it looks for the other one. What do you mean it looks? It predicts, it's, it, ah. it, it, it uh, predicts the other one, yeah. Okay, and the last one, uh, this I'll skip over, this is the extension of that to learning thresholds. Those, excuse me, those are sequenced? Uh, they can be hierarchical. Or are they uh, spatial uh, hierarchies? Oh, oh, it could be simultaneous. I mean, a pattern... Uh, uh, wait, no, okay, uh, 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 then the last thing is uh, something that uh, was sort of inspired by the connectome. You know, we've seen these random models. We saw GNP, and then there are very nice extensions to this, uh, power law graphs and small world networks that explain things about things like the internet and social networks. One thing they don't seem to capture is the clustering coefficient, the probability that neighbors are more likely to be connected. And for this, I want to mention, give you one slide of a new model. But before that, um, you know, this is relevant to neuroscience. Like uh, Christos mentioned in this paper, you know, this is about uh, highly non-random features in the connectivity. 
And so, you know, they find that things like reverse connections and triangles of various types are much more likely than you would get in a random graph, random directed graph. So uh, we need these uh, models. One nice thing here, again, from a theoretician's perspective, is that no you know, generalization of a single random graph, like a stochastic block model, can do this. It, its size must grow with the, with the size of the graph, linear in the size of the graph. So you, you can't capture it with the, you can't get both triangles and number of edges correct if you use a stochastic block model, even for a hypergraph. This is a provable statement, unless you use the block model proportional to the size of the number of vertices. However, here's a very simple extension of GNP. You build a random graph, you build a gra graph on this model by picking random subsets of vertices and placing a random graph on them. But these are going to be slightly denser. So it's a union of relatively dense random subgraphs. With this, uh, you can get uh, clustering coefficients to vary as you want while capturing degree distributions. And in particular, the notion that higher degree vertices are in fewer triangles, so the chance that higher degree vertices have common neighbors is lower than that of uh, lower degree vertices. That happens, you know, in GNP, it's flat. The probability of them being joined is independent of the nodes degree. But you get that in this, in this model. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop here. Probably out of time. <laughs>